So today, our plan is we're going to start with a little bit of a review of Math A stuff. Um, that means that we're going to go quickly through this. This is things that you should know. Um, so we'll start with, there's an appendix in your book called C, like Appendix C. We'll be doing C1, we'll take a break from that, do C.4. That's a little about factoring. You guys remember factoring? We're going to talk about factoring because that's a huge part of our class. Then we'll get back into that, talk about some equations. But right off the bat, we're going to talk about section C.1. And we're talking about equations. Just like you've had back from your, your pre-algebra days, we're going to deal with some basic equations here. So let's take a look at one. You know when I teach, I usually, if I, if I have steps to it, I'll put the steps off to this side so you can kind of follow along later. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve this equation together and I'll put some steps on how to solve equations in general over to the right. Hey, just by a show of hands though, how many people feel they can solve this problem right now? Cool. If you raise your hand, what would you say would be, come on in, have a seat. What would you say would be your first step? What would you need to do here? Good, so why? So can we do anything with this problem the way it is right now without distributing first? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's do that. So our first step to any equation is we're going to look at both sides of our equation. And we're going to simplify both sides. Of course, our equal sign tells us what the sides of an equation are. If we look at the right-hand side, we really don't have much to simplify there. We have some non-like terms. We can't combine them. We can't distribute. On the left-hand side, we have some parentheses. So what simplify means to us is that we could distribute. <clears throat> and potentially, when you distribute, you may have to combine some like terms. So that's really what we mean. We mean get rid of parentheses. Combine some like terms, get it as simple as you can on each side. Are you guys with me still so far? Give me a head nod if you're with me still. Okay, good. Let's give that a try. You guys already said distribute. So if we distribute, what does that mean? Someone else on the left-hand side of the room. What does distribute mean to you? Or my left? <laughs> Pass out evenly. How? Do we add? Multiply. Okay. So we're going to take which number, which term, and multiply it inwards. Okay. Does it go to the first one, the second one, or both of them? Uh, the first one. So I like to use those little arrows just to say this is what we're multiplying in. So really what we're having is we have our 4 times x, and we're going to get how much out of that? Uh -huh. And then what's the next sign that we're going to write? Okay. So this, really when you think about when you were taught distribution a long time ago, you were taught that the signs really do take care of themselves, right? If we take, consider this as a positive 4, we do positive 4 times positive x, we get positive 4x. We do positive 4 times, I know that's not negative 2, but you can kind of cheat a little bit and consider it to be a negative 2. And we do the 4 times negative 2, we're going to get our negative 8, or we're just going to write minus 8. That right there works because you can separate this as plus negative. You were taught that a long time ago. So we're going to distribute to both of these terms. We have our 6x minus 10. We check to see if we have any like terms to combine. Do we have any like terms in this problem? Mm -hmm. yeah. Be careful when you say that. Be careful when you say yeah. Um, let me rephrase and uh, give you a little definition of like terms, and then you can tell me yes or no, OK? Like terms have to be on the same side of an equation. Same side. So look over here. Do we have any like terms? No. no. These ones aren't, aren't considered like terms yet because they're not on the same side of the equation. Here we have variable, we have number, not like terms. Same thing here. These ones again are not like terms because they're not on the same side of the equation. So what do we do now? Would you add or subtract the 4 from the 6 and keep, move it to the other side? Would you just like subtract 4x minus 6x? 
Do we have to do it from one side or both sides? Both sides. And the idea is that what we're trying to do here is we're trying to make these like terms. And by, by subtracting from each side, we get this thing over here and make it a like term. So that's a great, great answer here. Our second step is, by the way, why do we want to move the 4x and not the 6x? Unless you have a positive number. That's great. So we're really, on our second step, going to get rid of the smaller variable. So we're going to say eliminate, by the way, I'm not the best speller, you're going to find this out. Uh, so if I make a mistake, don't hesitate, just let me know. Okay. And if we do the smaller variable, if we eliminate that variable, we're always going to have a positive variable on the side, and that's kind of nice. We don't have to divide by negatives at the end. So here, we'll look at this. We'll say, okay, we got our 4x, we have our 6x. We're going to identify the smaller one here. We're going to get rid of it by addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. You tell me. Subtraction. In this case, yeah, subtraction. You're, to eliminate a smaller variable, you're always either adding or subtracting. The only time you ever really divide is at the end, unless we have some fractions in there. But with our basic equations, that's the only time it happens. So we'll subtract 4x. Subtract 4x, and notice what happened. As soon as we have this on this side of an equation, maybe you've seen a teacher do this to show the, the size of an equation. Now these are like terms. Now you can combine them. So when we do this, what's our 4x and minus 4x? How much do we get there? there. What's left on the left-hand side? Negative. Good. Goes to the side. That negative's still there. On the right-hand side, what do we have? 2x. Cool. Are we done? No. Because the idea is really solving. We're trying to get x by itself. What's the next step? We look where the variable's at. Uh, what's the next step here? So we can't deal with the 2 yet. We've got to deal with that 10. You're exactly right. So left-hand side, everybody, what do we get? Two. It wasn't everybody, but I'll take it. <laughs> Yeah, the minus 10 and the 10s are gone. Last step, what are we going to do to get the x by itself? What's the last step? Yeah. Typically, that's the last step all the time when we're solving equations, is we're going to divide it. So when you divide by 2, what do we get? One. Can you check your work here? Yes. How do you check your work? You said it? Yeah. Plug it in, evaluate, take this one, put it in for the x, and see if it works out. This one's going to work out. Uh, but that's our, our way that we, we solve these equations. So the last step, <clears throat> step three, is you're going to solve the rest of it like you normally would a simple equation. I'm not going to give you every step because we've done this a lot in like your math, a, your math A days, all that old stuff. So solve as usual for the rest. Okay. Now I'm going to give you an opportunity to do one on your own. So I'm going to erase this. You have it in your notes. Do you guys have this one? Okay, I'm going to erase this and give you an opportunity to do one just so you can get your head wrapped around this because if you're anything like most people, did you do math over the summer? No. Unless you're in summer school. Did you do math over the summer? Yes. Yeah, did you really? Yeah. Awesome, me too. Online. But that's because, you know. I teach math. That's kind of my job. But yeah, most people don't, right? So let's get your brains kind of working on your own, because I just did that problem. Some of you helped me with it, but I want you guys to be sure that you can do this on your own. So try this really quick. Let's do 6x minus 3 equals 3 times the quantity x minus 5. Follow the steps down. Do what we need to do. I want you to simplify both sides, get rid of the smaller variable, solve it, and then check to make sure you have the right answer, okay? I'll be walking around. This is what I'm normally going to do in this class. If you need help, raise your hand or just look at me like, I don't know what's going on, and I'll help you out. Also, I'm going to pass out the roll sheet. Uh, just find your name and put your initials. I put a check mark, but for you guys, I want you to do the initials, okay?
By the way, you might not have got a fraction, but is it okay to get fractions when you're dealing with equations at the very end of your problem? Yeah, yes. Sure. So get rid of that. You don't always have to get only. <clears throat> We're going to give this a try here. Again, our first step is you're going to simplify it. If you have parentheses, get rid of them. We know how to distribute. So we're going to distribute any parentheses. Left-hand side, are we good or not? Do we have anything to simplify over here? No. Okay, so we're going to just rewrite that. On the right, hopefully you got 3x minus 15. Did you all get that? Yes. Awesome. Do we have any like terms? No. Good, good call. You remembered that. Like terms are each side of the equation. So what we're looking for now is after we've distributed and tried to combine like terms, we're going to eliminate the smaller variable. In our case, we're going to have that 3x. So we're going to eliminate the 3x, and here we're also going to be using subtraction. So as long as we do this to both sides, it's an equation after all, right? What you do to one side, you have to do the other. As long as we do that to both sides, we're good to go. Left-hand side, we'll get what? Okay. Right hand side, this is why we did that step. We're just going to have how much? Negative. Don't forget that negative. And lastly, we're going to solve it like we, we've already known how to do for a long time now. We're going to add 3, get rid of our constant term first. We'll have 3x equals hopefully negative. Is it negative 12 or negative 18? Okay, good. Remember your addition rules, right? Different signs. Subtract and keep the sound of the bigger one. Absolute, absolute value speaking, of course. And lastly, we'll divide. So we'll divide this by 3. And hopefully, you got how much? Negative 4. Perfect. That's exactly right. Did you check it? Did you make sure you were right? Mm -hmm. Good. Good. How many people feel okay with solving these basic, basic equations? Of course, this is review, right? We should have this kind of down in our heads. Let's move on a little bit. We're going to talk about what happens when you have your favorite thing in the world. What's your favorite thing in the world mathematically? I'm being sarcastic. What's your favorite thing in the world? Yeah, say it. It starts with an F. It's not the other one that you... Fractions. Fractions and the other one maybe go together in your head. No, no. Fractions, yeah. You're, a lot of people were right on that one. Why don't people like fractions? Look intimidating. They had more stats. They do, they do, right? No one likes fractions because they're harder. That was, most people would agree in this class, probably pretty basic, pretty easy stuff. But as soon as you add fractions, people get A, intimidated, and B, maybe they forget all the steps. C, they get confused on which steps you use in which cases. So how would you like to learn in equations how to not ever deal with fractions? Tell me more. Okay, should we learn that? Yes. Let's do that. So let's give an example about some fractions and see how to overcome this thing. Let's try x over 6 minus x over 8 equals 1 8. Now, there are a few different ways to do this problem. One way would be, could be, to combine these first, then use it like a reciprocal idea. But there's another option if we have an equation. Do we have an equation up here? Yes. By the way, what tells you you have an equation? The equal sign. Yeah, if there's no equal sign, you don't have an equation. You do have an equal sign? Hey, that's an equation. If you have an equation, it implies that if you don't have an equation, this is not going to work. Are you guys clear on that? Someone might have got an email. Email? <clears throat> but if you have an equation, I'm going to teach you how you can get rid of fractions in just one step right away so you never have to deal with them and turn this into a pretty basic problem. You ready for it? Mm -hmm. What you're going to look for is, do you remember this term called an LCD? What's an LCD mean? Yeah. If we can find LCD, we can eliminate fractions in an equation. So our goal here is when we have an equation that has fractions, when an equation, remember this is an equation, has fractions, What we're going to do is we're going to find the LCD. And we're going to multiply both sides of members an equation. You've got to do what, for one side, the other side as well. We're going to multiply both sides by the LCD.
By the way, I'm going to leave a little blank spot here, and I'm going to fill it in in just a minute. by both sides by the LCD. Let's work on the LCD. What are our denominators here? How many denominators do we have in our equation? Three. How many total do we have? Three. Three total. You've got to look at all of them. So one, two, three. Now, two of them are the same, so that's the same number. How do you find the LCD? Let's review that for a second. Do you just multiply the numbers together? That's one way to find a common denominator, but it definitely might not be the smallest common denominator, the least common denominator. So, one good way to find the LCD, take the biggest denominator that you have, in our case, 8. Start finding multiples of that thing. So, the first multiple is 8. Does 6 go into 8? No. So, go bigger. What's the next multiple of 8? Does 6 go into 16? No. What's the next one? Does 6 go into 24? Yes. That's how you find your least common denominator. That's a real quick way to do it. So, what we're going to do up here is we're going to write LCD is 24. And what I said is we're going to multiply both sides by the LCD. Let's try that. Do I mean LCD over LCD or just LCD? LCD. Just LCD. Just LCD. Yeah, watch what happens. If we multiply the right hand side by our LCD, so times 24, and I multiply the left hand side by 24, First of all, can somebody tell me what's not quite right about this the way it is right now? It's happening on the left-hand side, as a matter of fact. Good. So if I'm talking about the left, like both sides here, I don't just mean this one, do I? No. I mean, well, what's that process that I'm showing you right here? We're going to have to distribute. Let's see what happens when we distribute. If we take this to, does it go to the first one, the second one, or both of them again? What, how does distribution work? So this goes to both of our inside terms. We'll have 24 times x over 6 minus 24 times x over 8 equals 1 8 times 24. Okay, take a moment to take that in, because this is a little bit more advanced than the thing we just did. Firstly, are you okay with finding your LCD? Mm -hmm. Are you okay with multiplying both sides of an equation and then distributing? Mm -hmm. So how many people are alright with this so far? Raise your hand if you are. Good, okay. By the way, this is what I'm going to fill in over here. When you multiply both sides of an equation by something, what it comes down to is just multiplying by every term. That's really what we're talking about. When you distribute this, notice how the 24 get multiplied by this term, and this term, and this term. That's all we mean. In fact, I don't really even care about this particular step, as long as you know that the LCD is going to be multiplied by every single term. You'll be all right in this. Now, do you have to be okay with that? Okay, so do you have to show me this step? Only if you want to, you can. I need you to understand that we're multiplying every term by the LCD. So this means every term. This means every term. Now, what happens when you multiply by the LCD? Let's take a look at it. You might remember how to change a whole number into a fraction. How do you change a whole number into a fraction? Let's do that. If we really do that, we do 24 over 1, 24 over 1, and 24 over 1. Can you tell me what's going to happen? 24x over 6. Well, we have 24x over 6. We do have that. We could multiply straight across, right? We get 24x over 6. goes into 24 times. Oh, it's right, because we know how to simplify fractions as we go, right? Don't, remember doing, don't you remember doing that? Don't know. That was the fun part of fractions. You get to cross stuff out. I love that. So we get to cross this stuff out. We look at these and we see if there's factors on the top and the bottom, the numerator and denominator, they're the same. If there are, we can simplify them because we really are making fancy ones out of it. Make fancy ones, multiply by ones, or anything. You learned all the basics back in Math 80 to do this. So we say, okay, is there any number that goes into both 24 and 6? 6. You know what? 6 has to go into that number. That's why we chose 24, because LCD takes those numbers as factors, right? Mm -hmm. So this number is going to have to go into that, which means that it's going to simplify out. 6 goes into 6 how many times? How many times does it go into 24? 
Can you tell me what's left over out of this whole term? Perfect. Minus, does the same thing happen here? Yes. 8 goes into 8, well, one time, 24. We have the minus sign that, that carries down. We have 3x. And then on the right-hand side, same thing happens. 8 goes into 8 once, into 24 three times. What do we get on the right-hand side of our equation? Cool. Does this look easier than that? Yeah. Now, it took us quite a long time to actually do this because I was talking through it, but that's pretty quick. I mean, you just find your LCD, you multiply every term. It does cancel out because it has to. And then we have a very basic equation with absolutely no fractions whatsoever. So, let's go back to our previous steps that I, I showed you. The first step was simplify both sides. Are my sides simplified? Do I have any dis distribution of you? That's no parentheses, but do I have any like terms? Yes. Notice the difference between the first equations and, the, and this next one. These are on the same side, they are like terms. So, what's our 4x minus 3x? Do we have to put the 1 in front of it? No. Hey, we're done. This will still check, even though it will give you some nasty fractions up there, like, well, 3 over 6 is 1 half minus 3 eighths equals 1 eighth. It will still check out for you. How many people understood how to do, do this problem feel okay about it? Good deal. I am going to give you one to try on your own. Let's try that out. Just to make sure you can handle this. So let's do y over 2 minus y over 5 equals 1 fourth. So give that a try. Remember, anytime you have an equation, you can eliminate those fractions. That's a great thing. That's a great thing about equations. Give that a try. I'll be walking around if you need help. LCD multiply it by every single term. That should eliminate your fractions for you, and then we solve it like normal. Hey, shout out your LCD to me. What'd you find? 20. Is it 10 or is it 20? Let's 20. talk about that. 10 or 20? 20. Why is it not just 10? Yeah. You know what? We've got to consider all three of these fractions. If you found the 10, guess what would happen? You'd get all the way down to this step, and you would still have fractions. That should be an indicator that you picked the wrong LCD. If you still have fractions, you've done something wrong, go back and fix it. So here we go, okay, we have our LCD of not 10, but 20. We're going to take and we're going to multiply both sides. That means every single term by 20. So I, I really, I don't need to see this step if you don't want to. I'm going to put it right here. Times 20. Times 20. Sorry, it's a little cramped. Times 20. And really what we mean is 20 over 1. See what that lets us do, since we use all three of our denominators, it means all three of these denominators are going to be factors of our LCD. It has to. It's the way LCD works. So we're going to simplify now. What do we get when we simplify our 2 with our 20? Perfect. So right down here, we're going to have our 10y. And our 5 over 20, what's that give us? So we'll still have our minus 4y. And lastly, on the right-hand side, again, 4 with 20 gives us... So 1 times 5 over 1, we're going to get our 5. We done yet? 
Yeah. Next step, what are we going to do? <coughs> Great, you can use the appropriate terminology. I love it. So combine like terms, same side, we're going to get 6y equals 5. And our last step, folks, when we're dealing with equations is usually 2. Divide by what? Six. Wait a second, 6 isn't going to go into 5. So we're going to get y equals real nasty 5 sixths. Would you show me if you got this right? Perfect, all right, good deal. So we kind of conquered the basic idea of equations. We know how to change fraction equations into basic equations and then solve them. That's kind of great because we never have to deal with fractions and equations. And so let's move on a little bit. So we're moving along, we got all this down, and then we get to this problem. Okay. We go, all right. Is it still an equation? Yes. Huh? What do you do? Can we solve it like we solved the previous problems? For instance, the previous problems would have been something like subtract 6, combine your, wait a minute. Do we have any like terms up here? So what you're saying is we, even though we have two x's, we don't have any like terms. That's something we haven't dealt with yet in this class. Uh, you probably dealt with it in your math day class. But there was something kind of unique that you did here. You can't solve this directly. You can't just hammer at it and subtract and add and divide and get the right answer. There was another thing that we had to do to solve this problem. Do you remember what you had to do to solve this problem? Change the form. Change the, what do you mean change the form? If we try that, if we do, form, that's right? a great idea. That is a great idea. It's already in standard form here. If we subtract the six like you would on the other problems, what's still going to happen though is we'd have. You like that, right? We have a couple x's that we can't do anything about. Even if we subtracted the five x. I'm not showing you all the steps, but that's what you get, right? Mm -hmm. How much is x? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How do we get rid of that? I don't know. There's an x on both sides. That's never a good thing. Our whole goal was try to get x's on one side before and then combine them. But that's this. And if they're not combinable, there's something else that you need to do. Do you before. factor it out? You factor it out. So what, right now, what we're going to do, in order to solve this equation, you have to factor it. We're going to learn how to factor it. So we're going to take a break from section C.1. This is C.1. We're going to come back to this problem uh, probably tomorrow. But we're going to take a break, and we're going to learn how to factor really, really well. Do you want to learn how to factor really, really well? Yes. I'll make you a guarantee. If you can't factor, your success in this class is going to plummet. You have to be able to factor, because that's a lot of what we do. A lot of what we do has to do with factoring. So, OMG. How do we do that? Did I just really say OMG? Oh, Let's <laughs> discover how to factor that. We're not going to start off with this one. We're going to come back to that. We're going to build up to that problem. <coughs> I am going to give you a whole bunch of steps for factoring, though how to do things. The first step that you're going to have to do, and you know what, people forget all about this step all the time. Uh, right at the beginning, they're great at it, but then when we deal with the more advanced factor, they always forget about the step. Don't forget about the step. It's for you guys. Don't forget about the step. Step one is, please factor out the greatest common factor first. Right off the bat, if you have a greatest common factor, get rid of that thing. We'll talk about that in, in just a second, what that actually means. Factor out the greatest <coughs> common factor. First, before you do anything else. You might not always have one though, so I'm going to put if this exists.
But you always should look for it. Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Now, yeah, so that first thing you check, greatest common factor, we get it done. Next thing you check for is you count the number of terms that you have. Number of terms are those things that are separated by pluses and minuses. All right, so that's how we count number of terms. If you have two terms, there's a couple things we can do. So four two terms. If you have two terms, it has to fall in one of three categories in order to actually factor it. First thing you're going to check for is, I hope this, this sounds familiar to you, is if it is a difference of squares, have you ever heard of a difference of squares before? Mm -hmm. If you have not all, we'll talk about what that means uh, in a little bit. So first thing is a difference of squares. Here's what a difference of squares is. It says you have one number squared, a num another number squared, and what's the difference in mathematics? Minus subtraction. And there's a minus between them. That's a difference of squares. So difference of squares looks like this. Here's the general form. You have some quantity squared. That's one squared. Minus means a difference. Some other quantity. That's the general form for difference of squares. The cool thing about a difference of squares is they can always be factored. Always, always, always. And here's how you do it. It's not, not hard to factor it. You just have to know the form. Here's how you factor a difference of squares. You say, okay, I'm going to take our A plus our B. And then a different set of parentheses. What's this mean between these parentheses? A minus B. That's the difference of squares. Do you want to see why it works? Would you like to see that real quick? I'll give you the proof of it. Well, not really a full proof. But if we take this, I can prove to you that that equals this. So if I do your A plus B, A minus B. Do you know how to distribute two terms by two terms? The yeah, the foil, that's right. Yeah, exactly right. So distribution on that will give us, hey, what's A times A? A then we have A times negative B, that's going to give us minus AB. True? Yeah. Then we're going to have plus AB. Notice how it doesn't matter. Uh, multiplication is commutative. So that's plus AB. And then minus B squared. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen to your middle terms? Bam. That's awesome. Did it work? Yeah. Works every time. And this was general. We didn't make any assumptions about A or B. This works for everything. As long as you can have a, a something squared minus something squared, you see it, you can factor it. That's good news for us because it gets rid of the squares. Look at that. They're gone. That's fantastic. So difference of squares works very well for us. There's only two other ones, <clears throat> two other forms that you can have and still factor with two terms. The first one is a difference of cubes. What's, what do you think is going to be the difference between squares and cubes? Yeah. Three. Three. Yeah, the cube means a three, square means a two. So let's talk about a difference of cubes. Yeah, difference of cubes is really, really similar. The only difference is instead of the powers 2, we have powers 3. So we're going to have A cubed, still a difference, B cubed. And there's still a form that we have. So here's what we do. We'll have our A minus B. The second part's a little bit different than up here, though. You know what? Let me change this for you. Change it for your notes if you want, because I want to show you some similarities here. Can you make that a minus and make that a plus for me? Does it really change anything? No. no. no it really uh, but I want to show you that this, is, this happens in every one of these three forms. Notice how minus, minus, and then the different sign. Do you see that? <clears throat> this is the same. Minus, minus, and then we're going to have a different sign somewhere in here. 
Here's the second part of this, the second factor. We'll have our a squared. We'll have a plus. See how we have a plus here? We'll have ab. At the very end, we'll have plus b squared. Notice how we have same, different. We have same, different, and that one's a plus. That one's always going to be a plus, even in the next thing that I give you, okay? Are you okay with these, these terms here? The last one we can have is called a sum of cubes. What do you think is going to be the difference between a difference of cubes and a sum of cubes? Yeah, that's exactly right. <coughs> So it will look real similar. Still a cubed. We have a plus though. B cubed. And the form's even going to look similar to this. Here's the thing that's going to change. Notice how we had same sign, same sign. We're still going to have the same sign. So the first thing should be a plus b. Can you use a pattern here to kind of tell me what should be next? We should still have an a squared. You're exactly right. People have a plus or a minus. Minus. Give me a minus. A b. This one is still going to be a b squared though, and that happens when you multiply uh, negative b times negative b, you get a positive b squared. So it'll still be plus b squared. <coughs> you okay with those so far? Well, kind of. I mean, you have no examples for them yet, do you? So we're going to cover a couple of those so you actually know what's going on. Uh, but first I'd like to tell you what to do with three terms, and then we'll go through a whole bunch of examples and really get this thing nailed down. So, first, first part of our story. Get the greatest common factor out if you have one. Second thing, you count the number of terms. You have two terms, different squares. That's the easiest one. That's the best one. If it's not different squares, you check if it's a difference of cubes. If it's not that, you take sum of cubes. If it's not one of these three, and it has two terms, you cannot factor it. Does it look like I'm missing one? What about sum of squares? You can find out that sum of squares is not factorable. You can't factor sum of squares. Um, well, I'll, maybe I'll give you an example in a little while about how you can't factor sum of squares. But there's, there's nothing where that's a plus. There's a sum of cubes, but not sum of squares. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so we have our two terms down. Let's talk about what happens if you have three terms. For three terms, you're going to use something that's called, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, called the diamond method. If you haven't heard of the diamond method before, I'll teach it to you when we do our First example here in just a little bit. But we're going to have to use a diamond method. <clears throat> Actually, this is like anything like diamond, it's more like an X, but X method just sounds kind of lame. Diamond method sounds awesome, so of course you can use that. Okay, and the next one, the last one, if you have four terms, the only thing you can do is factor by grouping in this class. There is, There are ways to factor four terms, but it's kind of out of our scope here. So for four terms, the option we have left is factor by grouping. I'm hoping that you've seen that before also. We will review it. Bless you. Also, one more thing that I need you to do. Once you factor something, you're also going to check to see if the factors can be factored. Because sometimes you can factor several times. Are you with me on that? I tried, yeah. Some, I'm losing some of you, huh? Some of you are zoning already. I know it's our first class. You're like, oh, it's like 50 minutes of math. What's going on here? But uh, make sure you're still with me on this, okay? Factor your factors. Make sure you do that. So we'll say check to see or check if factors can be factored.
Okay, that was a whole lot of writing and not a whole lot of math. Would you guys like to see some examples on how to do some of this stuff? All right. That's kind of the answer I was hoping for. I just got you to say you all wanted to do math. Do you realize that? <laughs> gotcha. So the first thing we're going to do, let's see if we can start simply. We'll look at something like this. Eight A squared B minus four A B. Bless you. Man, you got it today, huh? Just kinda you got the sneezes going on. It's alright. Okay. First thing we look for is if it's a different square, it's different cubes. True or false? True. What do you think? What's the first thing that we should try to do at any time we ever factor? That is number one. Okay, before you even count the number of terms. So I really don't care that it's two terms right now. Don't care. It could be ten terms. The first thing we look for is factor the greatest common factor. Now here is what that means. The greatest common factor is a number or a variable or some quantity that divides every term that you have up there. So the first thing we'll look at is, is there a number that goes into both? How many terms do we have, by the way? Just so we get that down. Two. Two. We don't have one, two, three. We don't have six, right? Terms are separated by pluses and minuses. So one, two terms. We say, okay, what number divides both of these numbers? The biggest one. Greatest means biggest. What's the biggest one? Four. four. So we're going to factor out a four. Now, here's how you do that. What you're going to do is we're going to take that four and we're going to put it right out front. So we know four divides both of them. Then we look for any variables that may or may not divide. So we look at our a's. Do they have any a's in common? Yes. yes. How many? A or a squared? A. Just the a. This one has an a squared, but this one only has an a. So you've got to take the biggest one that's common to both. That is the greatest common shared factor. So we're going to write an A over here. Okie dokie. Is there anything else? B. 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 A, B is shared by both of them. So we're going to write that. This right here, which you just wrote down, is your greatest common factor. The 4 goes into both, the A goes into both, the B goes into both, and that's everything that they share. Are you still with me? Okay. The next thing we do as we write a parenthesis, because factoring is the opposite of distribution. Instead of multiplying in, we are dividing out. That means we're going to be creating parentheses. You might be wondering why in the world would you want to create parentheses. But I'll show you later on that problem why we have to have those. Okay? So we're dividing out, we are factoring out, we are creating parentheses. What we're going to put in here is the quotient of this and our greatest common factor, and this term and our greatest common factor. If you're good at this, you don't need to do any work other than in your head. If you're not so great at this, I'll give you a method on how to find these things. Here's what you do. You're going to write down your very first term. Some of you probably already know how to do this very well. And you're going to divide, because factoring is dividing by your greatest common factor. You've done things like this before, right? That's why you're in this class, because you've done that. Uh, what do we do here? How much is the 8 divided by the 4? So this is going to give us 2, okay, those are gone, 2. How about the A's? What happens with the A's? One A, where is it? On top. top. So this is an A, and then the B's, what happens with the B's? They're completely gone, yeah. So guess what, we have a 2 and an A, 2A. This, this is going to be worth it. What's going to go after the 2A? Minus, minus. Minus, okay, very good. We have to have the minus. And then in order to figure out what goes here, we do the same thing with the second term. You can do this as well. We'll take our 4AB. We'll divide it by our greatest common factor, 4AB. But guess what? We have the same thing over the same thing. How much is the same thing being divided by the same thing? That's always 1. This is going to go. Are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Can you check your work? Mm -hmm. Sure, you know what? <coughs> if you distribute it, which is you know the reverse of our, our factor here, we get our 8a squared b 
and we have minus 4AB. So this proves to us that we've just done our factoring correctly. Okay. Do you feel good about something like that, doing the greatest common factor? Now we go down here and we, we do this thing, check if factors can be factored. We would check this, that can't be factored, then you have plus or minus. That's just it, that's our, our term. We check this, this has two terms, so it would fall into one of these. Is it a difference of squares, a difference of cubes, or a sum of cubes? Well, let's see. It can't possibly be the sum of cubes, right, because it doesn't have a plus, has a minus. Is it a difference of squares? Do you see a little power 2 anywhere? Then chances are it's probably not a difference of squares. It can't be a difference of cubes. There's no power 3 anywhere. This can't be factored. You're just done on this problem. There's no other greatest common factor. We just took care of that. This is completely factored right here. You still with me? Okay. Let's move on to another one. So let's say, we just conquered that problem, let's say we have something like this, 36x squared minus 9. Tell me folks, what is the first thing that you're going to do? Are you going to start counting the number of terms first? No, no. Does that matter at this particular point right now? No. No, you're going to look for what first everybody, what are you going to look for first? Please look for that. Look for the greatest common factor first. Do this on your own right now. We just practiced that. What I want you to do right now, find the greatest common factor and factor it out. You don't have to say it out loud. Just do it on your own right now. What did you find as your greatest common factor? Did you find anything? <coughs> What I'm asking you is what number goes into both these terms? Nine. nine does, yeah. Let's factor out the nine. So if we factor out the nine, what happens is we have this nine, and then we're going to have a parenthesis, factoring it as creating parentheses. Inside here we're dividing, what's 36x squared divided by nine? Good, you still have x squared, don't you? Yes. Minus how much? One. Okay, cool. Now, the one of the the asterisk there at the very end of it said, you need to check to see if your factors are factorable still. Now the 9, of course, is just our number. But in here, that has two terms. Can we identify it as a difference of squares or sum of squares or some or difference of cubes? What do you think? Does it have a chance of being a difference of squares? No. Yeah. Yeah, squares. Do you see a square there? Yeah. Maybe we want to check. What you have to think of yeah. now is, can you write these two terms as something squared and something squared. Here's how difference of squares works. Remember it was a squared minus b squared. I need to write this as something squared, something squared. Now I'm going to ignore the 9 for a second. I'm going to look just at the 4x squared. Can you write 4x squared as some quantity yeah. squared? 2x. Okay, so 2, 2x squared like this? Yeah. Has to have a square. Has to have a square. X squared. 2x. 2x. How can I make this equal that? Square the whole thing. Ah. Does that work? Yes. Is yes. that 4x squared? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Minus. Now, wait a second. 1. How can I write 1 as something squared? Think about it for a second. 1 squared is 1. Oh, well, 1. Yeah, 1 squared. Well, that doesn't make a difference, right? 1 to the second power is still 1. So, watch what we're doing here. Now, by the way. You are going to be able to do this in your heads for most of this uh, without even having to worry about this step. Right now I'm showing you why it works, okay? But do you see how this form is the same as that form? How we have something squared minus something squared, and here we have something squared minus something squared. Are you, are you with me on this so far? Yeah. What we said over here is this is just going to be A minus B, A plus B. Can you tell me what takes the place of our A over here? What takes the place of our B over here? One. Yeah, that's exactly what we do. Something squared, oh, something. 2x. Something squared, oh, something. This is our A, this is our B. So if we write out the next step, what we're going to have is 
Look at, we're just using the form over here. A minus B, A plus B. Only now we just have to identify what was our A, what's our B. In our case, our A was 2X. Look what we're going to do. Our 2X goes here and here. Do you see where that 2X is coming from? Not your head if you do. I need to know if you know that. See where that 2X is coming from. It's right here, just going in both spots just like our A did. Now our 1 is our B. Our 1 is just going to go here and here. Hey. You're done. Isn't that kind of awesome? You can distribute this. 2x times 2x is how much? 4x squared. Bam. Look at You're going to get positive 2x and minus 2x. What's going to happen to those That's terms? And you're going to get a minus 1 at the very end. That's this minus 1. How many people feel okay with this so far? Good. Last thing i got to show you. What happens to the 9? That 9 doesn't just disappear, right? Don't ignore that 9. Our final answer, would, if we have everything down, so the 9 is going to come down here, we'll have our, our 9, 2x minus 1, 2x plus 1. We are completely flattered. Flattered. We're flattered here. <laughs> completely flattered. Completely factored, and we're, we're done. How many people understood what we talked about today? Good deal, good deal. Uh, we, we haven't gone far enough for me to give you a whole bunch of homework, so today's one day that we're not going to have anything assigned. Uh, we will start back on this tomorrow. I'll teach you some more factoring. You guys have a great day. All right, so yesterday we, we were factoring. We learned how to factor. What's the first thing you do when you're factoring, by the way? The very first thing you check. Before you start counting terms and all that stuff, you do this. That's right. Greatest common factor is a big deal for us. Um, so with that in mind, well, actually, let's practice one real quick before we start going on to those. <clears throat> I think we did this one last time. Is that, is that right? Yes. Okay, we worked that one all the way down, right? Yeah. Let's practice one more that's similar to that. Y squared minus 16. Now, I know the first thing we do is we check for the greatest common factor. When you look up here, does this one have a greatest common factor of these ter two terms? No. Well, not besides one, right? I mean, there's no other number that divides it, and there's no common variable. So we really can't factor greatest common factor out of this thing. This is one of those cases where it doesn't have one. But the next thing we do is count the number of terms. Again, how many terms do we have in this polynomial? Okay. If we have two terms, there's three options. We can be, what were those three options? Should be on your, your notes from last time. That's one of them. Difference cubes or? If it's not one of those three, you can't factor it. Is this one of those three? Yes. Well, wait a second. I see this is squared, but this one's not squared. How do you know? How come that's difference of squares still? Okay. So if we can write it as a difference of squares, then it is a difference of squares. So if we can say this is y squared minus, maybe we write this as 4 squared. If we write that as 4 squared, then we see this fits this, this model that we have of a squared minus b squared. And we know that that's factorable. This I gave you the form last time as a minus b, a plus b. Let's practice this one more time. In this case, what is taking the place of our a? Y. Good. What's taking the place of our b? Four. So if we follow this pattern, can you tell me how this is going to be factored? Remember, we're factoring, so we're creating parentheses here. What's the first thing we're going to write down? Y minus 4. Good. Y minus 4. Notice how Y is our A and 4 is our B. We have exactly the same thing there. And what's the next one? Y plus 4. Are you starting to see that these signs have to alternate in order for a difference of squares to work? This is the middle terms canceling out. That's what those different signs are doing. You get the y squared plus 4y minus 4y. That's where they disappear. Then we have the minus 16. How many of you feel okay with with this example so far. Good deal. Let's try one more before we go any further. How about this one? Y squared plus 25. Firstly, is there a greatest common factor to it? No. All right. So we count the number of term, terms. How many terms does it have? Difference squares? No. Think carefully about it. Yeah, you can write the five or the twenty-five as a five squared, can't you? Yes. You'd have y squared plus five squared. 
But is it a difference of squares? No. No. Do we have anything that says sum of squares? <coughs> this yeah. is not a factor rule. We have sum of cubes. Yeah, we have sum of cubes. But this isn't a cube. We have nothing to factor this. If you really think about it, could you factor it as, we'll try one. Could you factor it as y plus 5 and y plus 5? No, because you're going to end up with a 10y. You're going to get 10y, that's right. You get y squared, 5y, and another 5y, that gives you 10y. That's not this. What about if I change this to minus? Negative 10y. Yeah, I, I would. I would get y squared minus 5y minus 5y. That gives me minus 10y and then the plus 25. But you might be thinking, well, what happens if I just do the same thing? Well, in this case, yeah, we'd eliminate the middle terms. But look, would I get plus 25 or minus 25 out of this one? Minus. That wouldn't be the same thing. This would be the y squared minus 25. This one is not factorable. This one stays just like it is. You can't do anything with that as far as factoring goes. You're just done. How many people understood that feel okay about the fact that we can't factor some things? Okay. Do you feel okay about the two terms? First thing we do is we factor out Grange common factor. Next thing we do, we see if it's a difference of squares. If it is, then great. We're going to deal with a lot of difference of squares. If it's not a difference of squares or a difference of cubes or a sum of cubes, you leave it alone because you can't do anything with it. Let's move on to the three terms. Now, you'll notice on your notes from last time, the first thing we do is we check for a greatest common factor. So let's do that now. We have three terms here separated by those minuses. Do we have a greatest common factor? What we mean by that is a number or a variable or an expression that is common to all three of these, that divides all three terms. Do we have that? Okay, so we got to move on. Next thing I told you to do is you count the number of terms. Greatest common factors first, but you count the number of terms after that. How many terms do we have again? Three. Okay. If we have three terms, could it possibly be a difference of squares, a difference of cubes, or a sum of cubes? What do you think? Well, how many terms did all those have? Two. Do we have two terms here? No. How many terms do we have? Three. So that means the difference of squares and the sum of cubes and the difference of cubes are all off the table. Those are things that have two terms. If you have three terms, there's really only one thing we can do. We can use what's called the diamond method. You may have heard of this something else before. I'm going to show you how to do the diamond method. Are you ready for this? Are you sure you're ready? Nod your head if you're ready. Are you awake today at 7.09, 42 seconds? Okay, we're going to get awake because diamond method is awesome. <laughs> Here we go. So diamond method, what you do is you create, it's really not a diamond, it's like an X. It's really just a graphic organizer that helps you organize these numbers in a way that you can, you can see them. Here's what we do. First thing, thing i got to tell you is every single trinomial, that's just a three-term polynomial like we have here, is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. Have you, have you ever seen that before? Yeah. Okay. Here's the cool thing. These right here, these numbers are called coefficients. And we're going to be able to use those to help us factor. And in the future, we're going to be able to use those to help us solve these equations when we get back to equations. Here's what I'd like you to do. What I want you to do right now is tell me, in this polynomial, what is the B expression? Can you tell me what the B is? It goes with the sign. It goes with the sign in front of it. So what's the, what's the B? Very good. How much is the C? What about the A? Is it zero or is it one? one? Yeah, if it was zero, this thing wouldn't even be there, right? But remember, when, when you don't have a number up front, it's implied to be a one. So we can identify our A is one, our B is negative five, our C is negative 24. Here's what I want you to do. What we're going to do is we're going to put our B term here. And just so this makes us a little bit easier in the future, we're going to put our A term times our C term there. So let's move down here and let's actually try this with this example. What are we going to put up here again? 
up here at the top? B, which is what? Negative Just the numbers. Just the numbers. Negative 5. Okay, what are we going to put down here? We're going to put our A times C. What is our A? 1. one. Really, when you multiply that, that's not really doing a whole lot. But I'm going to show you why we do this in the future, okay? I'm setting you up for the future here. Uh, what is our C? Negative 24. So we're going to put 1 times negative 24. How much is that? Negative 24. We're going to put that here. Raise your hand if you're still with me. See where those numbers are coming from. Okay. So our B here, our A times our C here, and here's what you do. What you try to do now is you think of two numbers that at the same time add to this one and multiply to this one at the same time. So we're looking to add to this and multiply to this. Now, don't say it out loud. I want everyone to think about it because this is really the hard part of factoring is thinking of these numbers. It may sound weird that thinking of these numbers is the hard thing, but really this, this process will work for all these trinomials if they're factorable. All you have to do is be able to think of the numbers that add to negative 5 in this case and multiply to negative 8. I'll give you about 10 seconds. Just think about them in your head. Don't say them out loud. If you have them, great. Write them down if you'd like. If you don't have them, think about it right now. And I'll give you some hints about this. The signs of the numbers really tell you what you can and you can't have. For instance, uh, do you notice how we're trying to multiply to a negative number? Do you guys see that? That means the numbers we're going to be putting here and here have to be different signs. Do you see why? Yeah. Can't both be positive, right? Because when you multiply two positives, you get a positive. That's not going to work. Can't be two negatives, because you multiply two negatives, you get a positive. That can't work. So these signs have to be different. You with me? Also, the bigger number, I'm talking absolute value-wise, the bigger number must be negative because when we're adding them, we're still getting a negative. That should really clue you in on what these two numbers are. Have you found them out yet? Okay. Two numbers I'm thinking of that could possibly be 24. Well, we're thinking 6 and 4, right? Well, that can't add to that. 24 and 1, no. 12 and 2, no. The only other ones that are going to work are what? 8 and 3. One of them's got to be negative. One of them's got to be positive because of that. So we're going to write down 8 and 3. Which one has to be negative here? Yeah, because we're adding and getting the negative there. Are you still with me on this? Now here's what's kind of nice about it. When your A is 1, when your A is 1, you're pretty much done with this process. This is awesome. You've already factored this. You see these two numbers right here tell you what to write in, those, in the parentheses we're about to create. Remember, when we factor, we're actually creating parentheses. Remember how we factored these? We got a, we got a two parentheses out of this. We're going to do the same thing here. <clears throat> Just like we factored with our difference of squares. Notice how we had our y squared minus 4 squared. We put a y here and a y here. We're going to put a y here and a y here. Guess what we have to put next? Numbers on the side. Exactly what you found right here. That's why this is kind of nice. The diamond method works so well for us. It gives you a graphic organizer to organize these numbers. It doesn't really matter where you put the negative 8 and where you put the 3. It could be reversed. It doesn't matter because multiplication is commutative. It doesn't matter those order those factors. So here we're going to put, since it was negative 8, we're going to put minus 8. Since it was positive 3, we're going to put plus 3. And we've just factored our very first trinomial. Hey, can you check your work, by the way, on this thing? How would you check your work? Foil. Foil. Sure. Just distribute that, and we'll see if it works. Let's try that one time. I'm not going to be distributing a whole lot of these. But if we did distribute, we'd get y squared. We would get plus 3y. We would get minus 8y. And we would get minus 24. Is that going to work out to what we started with? It means we factored it correctly. So we have this thing done. How many people understand the diamond method? Good. I would like to give you one on your own to just to practice this. See that you can set it up, see that you can put the numbers in the appropriate places here, and then factor it. By the way, if you're very good at factoring, 
You always know how to factor this. It's just like, okay, this is really easy. Do you need the diamond method? No. Again, it's like using tools, all right? I think I've, maybe I've said this before in this class, but you can build a house with a rock, right? Can't you? Instead of a hammer, can't you just use a rock and hammer and nails? It's probably pretty hard. If I give you a hammer, you can hit those nails a lot better, right? This is like your hammer. If you want to go a different way and something you, you know or have used before, uh, you can use that. What I'm giving you here are tools. Okay, if you choose to use those tools, it'll probably make your life a little bit easier. You understand the, the analogy there? So I'm giving you some tools to use. Use this tool if you'd like. It will really help you out. Okay, but as we're doing this one, I'll be walking around the room. If you need help, let me know because this is really important things that you need to know how to do. If you're struggling on this factoring that we've already done, I'll try to help you out with that, okay? So why don't you give this one a try? We'll do x squared minus 7x plus 12. You're going to use the diamond method on this. You set the diamond. You put the B term on top, A times C on the bottom. Then you think of the two numbers that add to the top and multiply to the bottom. After that, you're done. That's the really hard part. Then we write uh, the whatever variable we have plus or minus those two numbers. Remember, you can always check, at least in your head, at least in your head, check to see if it distributes correctly. Uh, it'd be a shame for you to know how to do this and make a simple mistake on the test and this is wrong because you factored wrong. That would suck. And we're going to start on this here real quick. You're still working? Great. Keep working. What number goes on the top of our diamond here? Good. Very good. You included the sign. That's awesome. What number goes here? Good. Now, I don't want you just to just say this one. I want you to really be thinking it's multiplied by whatever number's here. In this case, it just happens to be a 1. That's how we're still getting the 12. Are you guys with it on that? Mm -hmm. This is going to change in just a second. I'm going to show you how, how this is going to help us. And then we think of two numbers. Again, the thinking of two numbers, that's the important part for you. And there's some keys to learning how to do that. Because we're multiplying to a positive, we know that these have to both be positive or both be negative. Both be negative. Why? Yeah, exactly. They're adding the, the negative number. Uh, so, what are they? Three and four. Sounds good to me. Of course, we're going to make them both negative, and we're going to check this. If this is right, the next step is going to be right. So, negative four plus negative three is negative seven. Is that true? Yep. Negative four times negative three is positive twelve. Then we're done. What we're going to do now is factor this the rest of the way to show our work, really. What are we going to write inside of our two parentheses? X minus 4x. Good. We have a variable x, so we are going to use our x. And we're just going to put the minus 3, minus 4. You can check it with distribution. That one's going to work out. Who got that one? Fantastic. That's really good. Very, very good. Now, of course, this begs the question, what happens if the A is not a 1? How do you do that problem? Before I answer that, I have to talk about factoring by grouping. Does it matter? Um, I know that it did for the first problem, but does it matter what order those go in? You mean the, uh, the these two? Yeah. It does not matter the order, huh? Because if you switch these around, multiplication is commutative, right? Mm -hmm. So it really doesn't matter which one we have first. The same thing happens here. If those are backwards, it wouldn't make a difference at all. That's a great question. Thank you for that. So, like I said, I have to show you how to factor by grouping because we're going to use that in the next step here. So, remember how to factor four terms? Or how we said we were going to factor four terms? We had to use something called factoring by grouping.
let's see why this is our only option, okay? Firstly, I want to, want to look at that. Can you recognize that there are, in fact, four terms there? No. All right, good. Does it have a greatest common factor? Because that's our number one thing. Does it have a greatest common factor? Okay. Does it have two terms? I'm, so, I'm sorry, exactly two terms. Does it have exactly two terms? Could it be a difference of squares, a difference of cubes, or some cubes then? So we move down. Does it have three terms? The next thing on your list was four terms. I said factoring by grouping. How many people have seen factoring by grouping before? How many people have never seen it or completely forgotten, which is all right? You can raise your hands. That's okay. Okay, good. <clears throat> factoring by grouping works like this. Since there's four terms, you look at the first two, and you look at the last two kind of independently, and you factor out the greatest common factor from each of those pairs of terms. So let's ignore these terms for now. We're going to look just at these ones. Look just at those ones. Can you see a greatest common factor in 5x squared plus 5? Yeah. What's it have there? Five. Let's factor out the 5 from just these two terms. So from here, notice how I'm putting a little bracket here. If we factor out a 5, remember we're dividing, what's going to be remaining in our parentheses there? X plus 1. Be careful, yeah, we do have the X squared here. Oh, you know what, I think I messed this up. Yeah, I did. Change that to a Y, sorry and change this one to an X. Figures. Did you change it? Yeah. Were you writing in pen and now you have scribbles? <laughs> okay, so we have Y squared plus 5. We saw that the 5 is common to both terms. We factor out the 5 and we're left with Y squared plus 1 inside our parentheses. We're going to look at the next one. So we, we ignore the part we just did. We look at this part. Is there anything in common between X, Y squared plus X that we can factor out? Let's factor out the X. We have to factor out the positive X. We're going to have that plus there still. What's going to be remaining if we factor out the x? Y squared. Y squared. Perfect. So we use some basic factoring here, factoring the 5, factoring the x, to make it in this form. How many people are with it on getting down to this form? Feel okay about that? Here's the cool thing about factoring by grouping. If you look at that, this is like one big term, and this is like one big term because it's added together. These are a couple factors in there. What you look for now is in these big terms, is there anything that's still in common? This is why factoring by grouping works. If you still have something in common, i.e. the y squared plus 1's, you can continue to factor that out. Now here's how you do it. Remember, factoring out is dividing. I'm going to make this real clear for you so you see why this works, because a lot of people get kind of screwed up on factoring by grouping because of because it looks a little strange. Here's what you do. Remember here, when you factored out the 5, the 5 went out front, and you divided each term by 5, and that's how we got these things. Are you clear on that? We're going to do the same thing with this. Since we have y squared plus 1 and y squared plus 1, we're factoring it out, which means we're dividing it out, which means when we write this out front, just like we did over here, we are going to create a new set of parentheses. We just have to worry about what goes in these parentheses. Now, if we're dividing out this large term by y squared plus 1, what we're factoring, what's going to be left? I'm just from this part, what's going to be left? Just a 5. Notice how this is kind of similar. I'm going to do this off to the side, and then I'm going to erase it. Very similar to how I taught you in factoring at the very beginning of our, our lesson yesterday. If you're factoring out, the first term by the greatest common factor, which is the y squared plus 1 in this case. What's going to happen there? What are you going to be left with? That's where we're getting the 5 right there. 
that 5 is coming from the fact that we are dividing out y squared plus 1. It's going to the front because we are dividing it away term by term. Not sure if you're clear on that one. Yeah, that's confusing to a lot of people. Like, well, where did it go? Why don't we have it twice? What's the next thing that we're going to have? For the same reason that just happened. We're dividing it out. So the reason why we have it two times here and only once here is because you're factoring it. I can give you a different example if that didn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Think about this, okay? If you had x squared plus 3x, you'll need to write this just to kind of follow along for a second. Notice how we have an x twice, don't we? But if we were to factor the x out, we are going to have an x here, but the x disappears. Notice how we're taking the x and we're, we're moving it to the front because we're dividing it by each term. Or, sorry, we're dividing each term by it. The same thing's happening here. We're dividing each term by the y squared plus 1. We're moving it to the front of an expression. Whatever's left after we divide, goes in the second parentheses, including that sign. Yes, no? We're going to get a whole bunch more practice on this too. So if you didn't get it right now, I hope that you did. But if you didn't, we're going to get a whole lot more practice. <clears throat> See, now we're going to use this. And we're going to be able to factor three terms that might not have a 1 in the place of our A coefficient. Let me show you what that looks like. So we've done these ones. You feel pretty good about the diamond method so far, right? Okay, grouping, you feel okay about the grouping? Okay, let's go through our steps. First thing you look for, what's the first thing you look for? GCF. Good. Does it have a GCF here? Does it have a greatest common factor? Unfortunately not. So there's nothing we can factor out, but you know what? You still should look for it every single time. Because sometimes I'm going to give you some nasty big problems that look horrible, but if you factor the greatest common factor, they become really easy. So that's what you need to look for first. Otherwise, you deal with a diamond problem like 6,000 on the bottom. You don't want to do that. So factor greatest common factor right off the bat. If it doesn't have one, well, that's okay. But you look for it first. Second thing you do is, what's the second thing you do? Great, okay, so someone on the, my right hand side over here, how many terms do we have? Three. So that means a difference of squares, sum of uh, cubes, or a difference of cubes is off the table. We're looking at a diamond method. Factoring by grouping won't work because we don't have four terms. So we're down to diamond method. Can you tell me what number goes on the top of our diamond problem? Good. Can you tell me what number goes on the bottom? Is it negative seven or something else? Good, because we multiply the A times the C. That's why I had to do the A times the C over here, so this one didn't seem so weird. Uh, when we multiplied A times C, yeah, it was 1. It really didn't change that number. Over here, it is going to. This is not going to be negative 7. It's going to be negative 14. Are you with me on this? Okay, good. And the next thing we do, it's the most important part. I mean, everybody can fill this out, right? Y'all can fill out negative 5 and negative 14. That's the easy part. It just from here, multiply it there. The hard part <coughs> is now thinking of the two numbers that add to negative 5 and multiply to negative 14. I'm going to give you a couple seconds, probably 10 seconds. Do this on your own. This is the part that you need to practice with, okay? So try this right now. If you know it, great. If you don't know it, think about it. Remember, those signs give you clues. Negative on the bottom says they have to be different signs. Negative on the top says the bigger one has to be negative. Have you thought about it? Have you found them? Yeah. What do you found? Yeah. Seven, seven, two, somehow. That's great. Okay. Which one's got to be negative? The seven or two? So negative seven and positive two. Let's double check, okay, just to make sure we have this. Negative seven times two is negative 14. If they multiply, yeah. Negative 7 plus 2 is negative 5. Yeah. That means I have it right. If this step works, the rest of it will work out. The only problem is 
Let's say we went back and did it this way. Oh, yeah, great. This is easy. We're going to get x. Don't write this down, by the way. Just watch for a second. x minus 7 and x plus 2. We go, hey, we're done. Is, does that work? No. Check it with your distribution. We get x squared. Oh, right after that, we know it's wrong. What are we supposed to get when we distribute? That's a problem. That means this direct method without extra steps is not the way to go for this. Here, yes. We're going to talk about extra steps versus not extra steps. If you do not have a coefficient besides one, you don't have any extra steps. It's very easy. You take these factors, they go right there. If you have an A that is not one, two, three, four, five, six, something else, you're going to have an extra step here. So write that down. This is where you're going to notice, that was wrong, an extra step. Here's the extra step. What the diamond method allows you to do is take these numbers and break this middle term up. Watch what's going to happen. Please watch this. I'm going to leave this guy alone. This is going to be 2x squared still. However, this minus 5, I'm going to split that up. Notice how I could write this instead as minus 7x plus 2x. Back up here, minus 7. Do me a favor, look at that real quick. Does this expression still equal this expression? So I have not changed it besides the fact that I've split up this middle term using these two numbers, including their signs. Now, you're better with that. Why did I do that? Yeah, it's brilliant. Factor by grouping. Because as soon as I split the middle term, look how many terms it had now. What do you use for four terms? Exactly. exactly what we just learned how to do, this factoring by grouping stuff. This makes it easy. This makes it a step-by-step -step process. You do the diamond method. If it has an A besides 1 out front, you split that up and you factor by grouping. If it doesn't, you go directly to your factors. So, can we factor this by grouping? The answer is, if you can do this, factoring by grouping will definitely be possible in this. If you can't do this, it's not factorable. So let's look at factoring by grouping. We look at the first two, and we look at the last two. Look at the first two terms there. Is there anything that's going to factor out of 2x squared minus 7x? Let's factor the x. If we do, we're going to get 2x, because we take away one of those x's, we divide that out as 2x, and then what? Because we're dividing away 1x. Well, wait a second. Look at the next two terms. What goes into 2x minus 7? Is there a greatest common factor there? Yeah. Anything besides 1? If all you find is 1, write the 1 so it doesn't confuse you later. So if there's nothing else that happens, you go, oh, okay, well, at least I know I have a 1. You're going to see why in a second. At least I have a 1. What's left if I divide by 1? The same thing, you're right. Raise your hand if you're okay with this so far. So let me recap a little bit what we've done. We've done a diamond method like we did before. We have B here, A times C here. We found our two numbers that add and multiply respectively. We cannot go directly to our factors. It doesn't work that way because we have that, that two right up front. We have a coefficient that's not 1. So we have an extra step. We split up the middle term, no problem. This gives us four terms, which allows us to do factoring by grouping. We group the first two, we see we factor out an x. We group the second two, there's nothing to factor out besides a 1. Now here's how you tell you've done this correctly. This and this should be exactly the same. If they're not, you've made a mistake. Go back and fix it. This has to work. If you've done this correctly, this has to work. Are you with me on this? It's got it. So they are the same, which means we can go about the same thing we did over here. This part and this part, we're going to factor out. We're going to put our 2x minus 7. Remember, we're dividing it. We're factoring this out, so it's removing from both these terms. That's why we're only going to have it once down here. 
So we're taking this up front, and we're going to have another parentheses afterwards, and the only thing we have to do is write this term with this gone, and this term with this factor gone. What's going to be left inside of our parentheses? We just have an x. And this is the reason why I had to write the plus 1, because I can't have you forget about it, right? You don't want to forget about the plus 1. And then that plus 1. Could you check your work? Sure. Distribute that. See that this is 2x squared. You have a 2x minus 7x. Hey, that's negative 5x or minus 5x and a minus 7 variant. So this works just fine for us. It took us a while to explain that, uh, but this goes pretty quick once you get the hang of it. Let's do, let's do one more together. I'll give you one to do on your own. And then we'll go back to C.1 and finish off, see how this relates to our equations. We're going to try to go a little bit more quickly on this next one, okay? So stick with it, because I've already given you the steps. Oh, by the way, uh, the lectures are being posted online as we speak. So the lecture from yesterday is on today, and the lecture from today will be on probably tomorrow morning. So if you need a refresher on this stuff, go on there. Also, the homework assignments will be posted online daily. But you have to remind me at the end of class to give you my website, because I totally forgot to give that to you every single day so far, OK? <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to be able to find it. Okay, So let's try 9x squared plus 24x plus 16. By the way, this lesson is probably one you might want to go back and review throughout the semester, because it deals with factoring, right? We're going we're gonna to do this. Every single lesson almost. It's crazy. What's the first thing we do when we're factoring this particular item, this particular three term polynomial? We would look for one. Does it have a greatest common factor? Now we really want it to, but no, it doesn't. The 9, the 24 have one, the 24 and the 16 have one, but not all three of them have one. So what's the next thing we do if we can't find a GCF? What do we do? What now? How many terms? Okay, how many terms does it have? What's that tell you to do? Let's do a diamond. I want you to set up the diamond problem here. If you need a calculator, take out a calculator. That's fine. Hey, what number goes on the top of our diamond problem, folks? Perfect. What number goes on the bottom of our diamond problem? Yeah, that is... Oh, it looked bad, but it's not so bad, is it? Let's take 10 seconds and think of, if you need 10 seconds to do this one, think about what adds to 24 and multiplies to 144. They're both positive. They've got to both be positive. What are those numbers? Now, here's a key question I'm going to be asking you over and over and over again. Can we go directly to my factors, or do I have an extra step? What tells you you have the extra step here? We have the uh, number in front of the x. Yeah, excellent. That's exactly right. So we can't just go x plus 12, x plus 12, done. Yeah, it doesn't really work. Uh, we've got to do the extra step. And what the extra step allows you to do, again, is simply to split up that middle term. We have our 9x squared, that kind of looks like a g, plus 12x plus another 12x, and then plus 16 at the back end. So I'm rewriting this one. I'm just splitting this number up by these two numbers. That's all I'm doing. What's the next thing I'm doing? Hmm? Okay. Okay. I, did. I think so. I don't know. I really didn't hear that well. I was just giving you confidence so you can say it again. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we, we do what? And once we have our four terms, four terms should key you in on something. Great. Yeah, factor by grouping. That means we look for our greatest common factor here and the greatest common factor here. On your own, I want you to greatest common factor that one. And on your own, I want you to greatest common factor that one. You know you did it right if you end with a similar factor. What factors are the first two? What are we going to be left with from this part? 
great. Remember, you can always check by just distributing to make sure you have that right. That's key. Then we're going to have a plus because we have a plus there. That sign's going to follow down. It says we're going to factor out a positive something. That's what this means. So we factor out a positive what out of that? Four. four. And we're going to be left with what? Three x four. Did we do it right? Yeah. You can immediately check because this and this are the same. If those were different, you would have this problem wrong. What this says we can do is take this, since it's exactly the same in both of our large terms, factor it out. And what we're remain, what's remaining from each of these large terms is going to go in our second parentheses. What's remaining after we factor out our 3x plus 4? 3x plus 4. Well, that's weird. Did it ever happen before? Not in this class, but yeah, it happens often, really. Uh, this, this situation gives us the same factor twice, which you can distribute and see that you're right. Is there a different way that we could write this? Yeah. Great, okay, so as long as we put the square outside the parentheses of our 3x plus 4 squared, that's really the appropriate way to write that, and we're done. Why don't you try one on your own, then I'll, I'll kind of tie all this together with our equations and we'll call it a day. that on your own. Make up a diamond problem. See if it needs an extra step or not. You should know that. Figure out the rest of it. Factor it accordingly. And then distribute at the end. Just make sure you have this thing right. I'll be walking around if you guys need help. Just let me know. By the way, I'm not going to be going over how to factor sum of cubes and difference of cubes in class. I want you to look back. I'll give you just a couple problems in your homework, but it's really outlined well in your book. It's very similar to difference of squares. I want you guys to read that. I want you to look at it. If you need help on it, come by. I'll, I will help you on that. But I want you to read it for yourself. Is that, is that okay with you? If you, need, if you need more, come in. By all means, I will help you. I'm going to get started on this in about 30 seconds or so. Let's see how far we can get. Hopefully, we get done with this. We can't ignore a greatest common factor ever, but this one doesn't have one, just like the other ones did. It doesn't have a greatest common factor for us to take out first. So we count the number of terms. We see we have three terms. That means diamond problem. Hopefully you set that up correctly. We're going to have a positive 2 here and a what down here? Great. We're getting that by multiplying A and C again. We look and see that we're going to add to positive 2 and multiply to negative 15. Did you get those numbers? Let's try. No. How do we tell? How do we tell? Well, we have to check, right? We, this one would work here, but then when we add it, oh, that's, this is going to give us negative 2. That's a problem. So if that happens to you, it might happen. No problem. Just switch your signs. Go, okay, let's see if this works. Negative 15, yeah. Positive 2, great. This one works for us. So if that happens to you, make sure you double check before you go any further. This is a very good indicator. Well, Example for us to look at look at that fact that if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal. Just go back and fix it. Be checking your work every single step. That way you don't waste a whole lot of time getting to the end and having the wrong answer. That's that's the bad thing. Okay, are we going to go straight to our factors or are we going to have an extra step here? Extra step. 
And again, because the A is not 1, that tells us that. So we're going to break up our middle term. Hopefully you did this. <coughs> 5 squared plus 5x minus 3x minus 3. Now, I wrote this a certain way because I want you to see what happens over here. If you wrote this differently, you should end with the same answer. I just want to show you what happens on this part of when you factor by grouping. Did you make it down this far, folks? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So factoring by grouping, out of these first two terms, I'm seeing a 5x. So we're going to factor out 5x and get x plus 1. You still with me? Yes. Okay. The other two terms, here's what happens. If you have a, make a minus here, what this is telling you is you're going to have to factor out a negative out of this thing. We don't want to factor a positive 3. That's going to mess our signs up. So if you ever have a minus, what it says to do is, okay, I'm going to factor out a negative. What number is in common to both those? Three, three, three. It's going to be a negative 3 we're factoring out. Just do the math carefully. If we factor out a negative 3, what's negative 3x divided by negative 3? What's negative, just this part, what's negative 3x divided by negative 3? Remember, we're factoring it out. Positive x, that's what's going on. What's negative 3 divided by negative 3? Positive 1 or negative 1? Positive 1. So you're going to ask, Mr. Leonard, how did the signs change? How they, well, wait a second, where did that plus come from? We're factoring out a negative. We're removing that by division. That's why these signs are both changing. This, this we're factoring out a negative 3 from, and it's going right here. That becomes a positive x and a positive x. Are you, are you clear on this? Mm -hmm. So whenever you have a minus there, you're factoring out a negative. That's going to help you out a lot. And it, it says that we're right. I mean, we have this down. So we'll factor out an x plus 1. What are we left with? And it's factored. Now, what we're going to do in the last two minutes is we're going to go back to C.1. I'm going to show you how this works with our equations. And we'll start here next time. So if you remember this problem from last time, we had x squared plus 5x plus 6, right? That was, that was the actual trinomial there. But then we had an equal sign. Equals 0. We said, oh, that's an equation. How in the world do we solve it? Here's how factoring is incorporated with equations in order to solve this problem. We all know that the diamond problem would be here. I'm going to do the diamond problem quickly because we've already seen this. 5 goes here, 6 goes here. Are you with me still? Mm -hmm. We're going to get what two numbers? Mm -hmm. 3 and 2, 2 and 3. It really doesn't matter. Do we have the extra step or not for this? No. No, the one, it's a, a, a equals 1 there. So we're going to have x plus 3. That's right, x plus 2. But now this is different than other examples because we have this equal to 0. Now, this is a cool thing. We have to have it equal to 0 because we're going to use something called the zero product property. If this was not 0, folks, this would not work. This has to be 0 for this to work. But here's what the zero product property says. It says if I have two things that are multiplied together that equal 0, what do you know for a fact about one of these things? Yeah. One of them has to be. That's the only way you can multiply something and get 0. One of them has to be 0. Do we know which one? No. Could they both be? Yeah. So we're going to take this and apply it to this case. We have two things, this means multiplication, two things that are multiplied together to equal zero. Zero product property says each one of them could be zero. X plus three could equal zero. X plus two could equal zero. Can you solve this? Can you solve that? So if we subtract three, we get X equals negative three. Subtract 2, we get x equals negative 2, and you know what? We've got two solutions. Both of them are going to work. The reason why they work is because if you plug this in here, it creates 0. 0 times anything is 0. Plug in a negative 2 here, that creates 0. 0 times anything is 0. That's how we're going to use this in our equation. Tell me people understood today. Feel pretty good about it. All right. Um, all right, so as you remember from last time, we did our factoring. Uh, we're going to combine that with our equations and continue to solve some of those equations that involve factoring. The first one I want to take a look at 
They look a little intimidating at first, but if you follow the steps that I gave you in our very first lesson, how to solve those equations, and you follow our steps for factoring, these ones shouldn't be too bad. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this problem. So remember, we took a break from C.1 and we did the factoring from C.4. Now we're back to C.1 and we're going to use that stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at our problem on the board here. If you remember our steps from how to solve equations, can you tell me what's the first thing that we should do? That's from factoring. You have the great for factoring. When I'm talking about equations, what's the first thing we should do on this problem? Why? Yeah, exactly. Remember, we're trying to simplify, and we have to simplify both sides. So let's go ahead and distribute this one together. When we distribute, we're going to distribute this two into these parentheses. How many things does it go to? One, two, or three? Two. It doesn't go to this ten, does it? No. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and distribute. Can you tell me what I'm going to get? Two yeah. Plus ten. Perfect. Plus ten. That's still there. Very good. Equal. Left hand side's done. We've gotten rid of our parentheses. If we have to combine like terms, we'll do that on the next step. Let's go ahead and do the right hand side. What are we going to get now? That's a gr that's great. I want you wanted you to catch that. Are we going to have? Well, actually, it's going to be 20x, but are we going to have plus 20x or minus 20x? Why? Good. All right. So we're not just taking this number. We're taking the number with the sign and multiplying that to both of those terms inside. Of course, not the negative or the minus 5 at the end. So here we'll have the minus 20x and then minus 5. Are you still with me? Okay. Next step, we are going to continue down and see if we can combine any like terms Remember what we talked about like terms. They have to be on one side of an equation. So do we have any like terms in this problem? Yes. On the right side? No. On the left side? Yeah, just our numbers there. So when we combine those, we'll get our 2x squared plus 20. On the right-hand side, we're just going to leave it the same. Negative 2x squared minus 20x minus 5. Now we're going to look at this problem and I'm going to give you a little hint. Uh, before when we solved equations, before this particular problem, we didn't really have any x squareds. We had just x to the first power. We got rid of the smaller variable. Do you remember doing that on, I think it was Wednesday when we did that? We got rid of the smaller variable, then we solved it as usual. Those were your steps. If you ever have a power 2, if you have a power 2, we're going to solve everything to one side because we're going to have to factor. We, we learned this on, on Thursday that we had to factor in order to solve these problems. So what we want to do on this problem, get everything to one side and then factor it. Are you still with me? Nod your head if you're okay on that. So how do we get everything to one side? Which way do you want to move it? Do you want to move the stuff on the left to the right or the stuff on the right to the left? If we go from here to here, we're going to have a lot of negatives in there. Do you see that? Maybe not such a great thing, you can do it, but it's going to be very hard to factor it. Uh, if we keep our a term, notice how that's, our, that's going to be our a, do you see that? Like the x squared. If we keep that positive, it's way easier to factor. So let's go ahead, let's move this stuff on the right to the left. What do I need to do to do that? Okay. So we're going to add the two, I'm going to do the step by step so you really see it. Add 2x squared. That, of course, is going to be added to the 2x squared over here. And we'll get what? And we still have that plus 20. And on the right-hand side, we have minus 20x minus 5. Okay, keep going. Which one do you want to do now? Okay, either one really doesn't matter. We can do the plus 20x. Does it get added to either one of these? So we're going to add our own little space for this term. And we'll have 4x squared plus 20x plus 20, don't forget about that, equals negative 5. 
hey, am I good to go right now? Is this what I want to see? Do I want to have this stuff over here and a number over here? What do I want over here? Do you remember why I want zero? Someone who was paying attention to the last like two minutes of class yesterday, explain to me why I want zero on the right and not a number on the right. Go ahead. Then the zero product property will work. That's perfect. If you didn't hear her, she said that's because then the zero product property will work. This thing doesn't pick up voices very well, so I got to repeat right. that for you. No, no, you're fine. Uh, but that's why we need a zero over here. If we try to factor this right now, which factoring is the only way we can solve these type of problems, besides the quadratic formula, we're not there yet. It's, for right now, it's the only way we can solve these, and if we factor it and there's a number, the zero product property is not going to work. So, one more time, what do I need in order for factoring to work? What has to be here? Zero. Very good, yeah. We have to have a zero, otherwise we're, we're sunk. So last thing we're going to do is add that five. We'll do that to both sides. We'll get 4x squared plus 20x plus 25 equals 0. Awesome. How do we solve it? Thank you. Let's try factoring. What do you look for when you try to factor? What's the first thing you should do? GCF. Does this have a GCF? No. So what's the next thing you do? Number of terms, great. Okay, let's look at number of terms. How many terms do we have? Okay, is it going to be difference of squares then? Could it possibly be that? That's only two terms. So what are you going to use for three terms? Diamond. Set up the diamond method, see how far you can get on that. I want to see if you can factor it. Remember, I'll be walking around the room. If you need help on factoring right now, let me know. I'll help you out. By the way, folks, is this diamond problem going to have an extra step, or can we go directly to the factors? What do you think? Extra step. Yeah, definitely. Because our A is not one, we have that extra step. What number is going to go up top? What are we going to get for the bottom here? How do you get 100? Okay, good. Can you think of two numbers that add up to 20 and multiply to 100? 10. 10. 10. Good. Now, of course, we just talked about this, but you can't go directly to x plus 10, x plus 10, because this 4 is messing us up. That means we have our extra step. If you don't remember the extra step, extra step says you use these two numbers to split up this middle term and write it as a, as a four-term polynomial. So 4x squared plus 10x plus 10x plus 25. And then we also have it equal to zero. Don't forget about the equal to zero. It is an equation. We can't lose that. And the reason why we do the four terms is what? What do we want to do now? Yeah, because the grouping, that was awesome for us. We needed four terms to do that. So essentially, we're kind of tricking the problem a little bit and saying, oh, instead of having three terms, I'm going to make it four terms so I can group. Let's group this thing together. What factors out of the first two terms, everybody? Don't forget about the x. We're going to get 2x plus 5. On the right-hand side, what factors out of these two? We're going to put a plus there because we're talking about positive 5. And again, we get 2x plus 5. Did we do it right? Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what it tells you is those are the same thing, same exact factor there. So we'll continue. We pull that out front. And what is remaining in our parentheses? 2x plus 5. Yeah, this 2x and that 5. Do you see now why we can't have a number over here? If we had a number here besides 0, the zero product property would not work. We wouldn't be able to set each of these equal to zero. So now at this point, this is what we did the last two minutes of class last time. We would say, okay, we have two factors. Each of them could be equal to zero. Now in this case, notice how they're both the same. We don't really have to show the work twice if we don't want to. I know they're exactly the same. So if I set 2x plus 5 equal to zero, do I also have to set this one equal to zero? 
hopefully I'm going to get the same exact thing in each case, right? Normally, you would set each one of these equal to zero. And then we solve this down, just like you would a normal algebraic expression, which we're really good at, at solving at this point. So what are we going to do to solve that? Minus five. We'll get 2x equals negative 5. And the last step, everybody, what is that? Five. Is it okay to get fractions like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. X is negative 5 halves. We're done. As far as we can go in that problem. How many people feel okay with this example? So, yeah, they're long, right? They're long examples. You have to distribute. You have to combine like terms. You have to put everything to one side if it's a power 2 or higher. And then you get to solve it. So I'm going to make a couple notes on here for you to write down just to make sure you have this. For power 2 polynomials, if you ever see a power 2, set it equal to 0. Set the whole equation equal to 0 and factor. Would you guys like to try one on your own? Do you think that would be helpful for you? Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to give you one. I'll give you about, they, they take a while. It took us about 10 minutes to do that one. Um, I'll give you about three or four minutes. See if you can do it on your own that quick, okay? If not, just see it as far as you can go. I, I at least want you to get down to the factory portion. That's important. This one is going to be quite similar to this, this lesson that we did. So make sure we're simplifying both sides first. That means you might have to combine some like terms. Then look to see if it's a power two polynomial or poly power two equation or not. If it is, we know what to do in that case. I just gave that to you. See, lots of good work so far, lots of good distribution, lots of good showing steps, I like that. Remember, if you have an x squared up there, that means you're going to factor. And that means you have to get everything to one side and zero on the other side because otherwise a zero product property won't work. So make sure when you see that on your problems. You say, oh, there's a square. Factor it. Get it, get it over one side and then factor it.
Chances are you're going to want to keep the x squared term positive, so move things according to that. We're going to start in just a minute up here. Okay, we're going to get started here. Of course, the first thing that we want to do is we want to distribute because we're going to simplify both sides on this. So after distribution, we should hopefully have 8x squared plus 24 plus 4. You have the left side? On the right hand, right hand side, remember that we're distributing negative 8x. I always like to circle that. That way I see it in my head. I, I, I kind of pictured it, took a mental picture. That helps me to distribute it exactly to both these terms and get it right. So negative 8x times x, what are we going to get out of that? Negative Yeah, exactly. Don't forget that x squared. That's important. That has to be there. Otherwise, your problem just blows up in your face. The next one, what are we going to have? Plus or minus? Minus 24. Good, 24. Is it 24? 24 x? That x is important, right? That x has to go with it. You're multiplying by that x. It's got to be there. And then this plus 19 is at the back end. Now again, you do have options. You could move these to this side or these to this side. What we're going to do first is combine like terms and probably move these ones over here because of that negative 8x squared. We want to make that positive somehow. Are you with me on that? Did you do that? Good, okay. So combine like terms here, we'll have our 8x squared plus 28 equals negative 8x squared minus 24x plus 19. And we'll start moving all this stuff. So the first thing we'll move, <clears throat> by the way, can you do this all at once? If you, if you show your steps, you can, that's fine. Just don't, don't lose yourself on it. I go step by step, that way I don't get lost. We'll get our 16x squared. We still have this plus 28. On the right-hand side, we have our negative 24x plus 19. We'll continue. The next thing we got to do, we've got to add that 24x. It's got really nowhere to go over here, so we'll put this in the correct order and get 16x squared plus 24x plus 28. And we still have this 19 over the right hand side. We learned from our last example and from before that it's got to be a zero. So there's one more thing we have to do. We're going to subtract 19 from both sides. And we'll be left with 16x squared plus 24x. I think that's plus 9, isn't it? Yes. So what clued us in on what to do on this problem? First, it wasn't simplified. You had to simplify it. Second, we got down here, we saw some x squareds, right? Whenever you see that x squared that says, get everything to one side. After you combine like terms, get everything to one side. That's right here. You got to make sure that's a zero because a zero product property will work only if this is a zero. Now we're going to factor this thing. So hopefully you set up a diamond problem. What goes on the top of our diamond problem? How about the bottom? Oh yeah, because you multiply 16 times 9. Well, that looks really familiar. I think we had one really similar to this last time. And we get what? Hey, does this have the extra step or not? Yes. Awesome. So we're going to split this up and get the 16x squared plus 12x plus 12x plus 9, and that's still equal to 0. This lets us do our factor by grouping. Are you starting to get that down, that factoring by grouping? Is it starting to really make sense to you? I hope it is. If it's not, come and see me or review this lesson online and you can see this over and over again. We'll get our 4x out of that. We should get a 4x plus 3. And the right hand side we're going to factor out, yeah, exactly, and get a 4x plus 3. Again, we've done it right because we have exactly the same thing here and here. That's perfect. It's what we want. So we're going to take this piece and this piece and factor that out. And what we're left with is the same factor. We actually could write it as 4x plus 3 squared. If you want to do that, you can do that. And then we're going to set each of these equal to 0. However, there's only one 
unique factor. So we're going to set that one equal to zero. We'll have our 4x plus 3 equals zero. If we solve that down, what are we going to end up getting? Perfect. By a show of hands, how many people got negative three fourths out of this? Could you check your work, by the way? Yeah. It'd be kind of a pain, right? I mean, you have to plug that into that. But you could do it. A calculator would do it pretty easily. It's not too bad. <clears throat> well, I'm glad you feel good with that example. You're going to get a couple of these. Make a little note. You might end up getting one of these on a test. Okay, so that, I'll, I'll tell you that often. And if I tell you that, there's like a 99% chance you're going to get one of these on a test. So you'll probably get one of these on a test. But we're ready to move on. Let's kind of combine what we just learned about this factoring and these equations. We'll make it a little bit more interesting. We'll add some fractions to it and see if the same thing we learned on the very first day applies to these, these problems, okay? Let's move on. By the way, are there any questions before we get going? You guys know you can ask questions anytime, right? So if something's not too clear to you, just let me know. We're good? All right. Back to your favorite, right? You love fractions, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that look awesome? Aren't you excited for this problem? It's like Christmas. In what month is this? August? We're like four months early, folks. It's cool. Now, I'm just messing with you. But yeah, we have some fractions on this problem. Now, the first thing we learned about fractions is, what did we learn about fractions? Yeah, you didn't learn anything about fractions? Get rid of them by using... So we can get rid of them, right? Since we don't like them, we're going to get rid of these fractions. I hope, aren't we? What lets you know, though, I've asked you this before, what lets you know that you can get rid of these fractions up here? There's one specific thing, and if it's not there, you cannot do this step. We're, we're, going to be, we're not going to talk about GCF yet. That's when we're factoring things out. The, say that again. There's an equal sign. Yeah, that's right. If you have an equal sign, this works. Do you know why? I, I'll just focus on me for a second, okay? Do you know why if you have an equal sign, this works, and if you don't, it doesn't work? Do you know why? It's the fact that an equal sign creates two sides of something, right? And whatever you do to one side, you get to do to the other side. If you don't have an equal sign, there's no sides. Do you see what I'm talking about? That means you can't just arbitrarily multiply everything by one number and it stays the same. With an equal sign, we get to do that. Because if I multiply this by the LCD and this by the LCD, it stays equal. That's why the equal sign is so nice. If we don't have an equal sign, all bets are off, we can't do this. Did that make sense to you? Okay. So, now we did this earlier with some simpler looking problems. But what's the first step in, in getting rid of these fractions? What do we look for right off the bat? Let's find the LCD. Let's do that. How many denominators do we have? So we're considering all three of these denominators. Technically we have four because you could put this over one, but that one's really not going to do a whole lot for us. Notice how the X, folks, the X does not play into our LCD. Are you clear on that? Are you, are you sure you're clear on that? Because really this is like x over 1, and these are our denominators. So that's why that, that x is not going to play a part in this. So our LCD, can you look at that for me? What is our LCD, please? Uh, yeah, good. Take into account all four of those. Now, if you remember from last time, well, on Wednesday, what do we do with that LCD? Just the left side? Both, both sides. What's both sides mean? What, what do I mean by when we multiply both Every sides? Okay. So we're not just going to multiply this one and this one. What we're talking about is we're multiplying every single term by the LCD. Every one of them. So what we need from here is we're going to multiply this by 9, and this one by 9, and that one, and that one.
basically the same idea as before. Now, we'd like you to do something for me as you're doing this. I forgot one thing. I intended on purpose to show you. But please, would you do me a favor? And right before you do this, right before you use your LCD, there's something that needs to be up there. And this is going to kind of help you see a couple things. What needs to be up there is parentheses around any numerators that have more than one term. What I mean by that is this should have some parentheses around it. The 2, I don't care so much about that. The X, I don't care so much about that. But this one also needs parentheses. This is the important one in this case, and you're going to see that in just a minute. Okay, please be paying attention to this problem. This is going to bite a lot of people in the rear ends if they're not watching this right now, okay? Trust me on this one. So this, we're going to put parentheses around that. Now, the question is, am I going to distribute or am I going to simplify my fractions? What do you think? Simplify. Yeah, let's simplify. If we distributed, we have to refactor in order to cancel out those denominators. So right now is the point where you're getting rid of denominators. Let's do it. Does anything simplify in the first one? It has to, right? We use the LCD. So the three's gone. What does a nine become? Three. Perfect. What happens here? Okay. What happens here? Anything? Nine. Okay. What happens here? Good. So those nines are completely gone. Do me a favor. Okay. This is this is going to save your life. I promise. Well, it's going to save you time, which technically saves your life, right? So I'm saving your life here. Rewrite this problem before you go any further. Just rewrite what you have left. And trust me, it's going to save you, and I'm sh I'll show you why. I'll show you why. Watch. Just watch me first before you write anything down. Of course, we still have a 3, and we have an x minus 1. Notice how we needed parentheses around that. Do you see it? Mm -hmm. If you don't have parentheses around that, is 3x minus 1 correct? No. No, because you're going to have to distribute that. Plus, the 3 times 2, yeah, you can do that. That's going to be 6 equals, well, we are going to have the 9x, but watch what happens here. If you wrote this, you have this problem wrong. Your answer is going to be off. Do you see why it's going to be off? This, this minus right there, because this was a fraction, it was implied parentheses. That's how fractions work. It's implied parentheses on numerator and denominator. So this negative is actually going to distribute to both terms. That's why we had to have those parentheses there. This is going to end up being a minus 3. A lot of people on their homework, they give me plus 3. And the only thing I look for on your test, honestly, what I look for on your test, I'm going to look at this step and the final answer. If you have this step wrong, I know you don't know what you're doing. I just cross this problem. Right? If I see this step is right, and I see that the final answer is wrong, I know that you have the mathematics right, you just made some sort of calculation error, I give you partial credit. Do you see the difference there? You have to really follow this step down. You have to understand that this is implied parentheses and this is going to distribute and change those signs. Now that you have your with me on this. That's a, do you see why parentheses are important now? Okay. So we're going to rewrite this. That way we have everything set. We still need those parentheses. Now the next step, now we can distribute. Now we can see that if we can solve this problem. So the next step we'll distribute and get our what? Mm -hmm. Good. We still have the plus 6. On the right hand side we get 9x. What's the rest of it going to be? Great. That negative, it's like a negative 1 minus 2x. And minus 3. Hey, we're on a roll. Keep going. What's the next thing we do? Some in the middle here. Some in the middle, what do we do? Okay. Like terms on the left, what are we going to get when we combine those? Perfect. On the right hand side, I'm seeing a couple like terms, the 9x, the minus 2x, that's going to give me 7x minus 3. Okay, I have a question for you. We've simplified, we have both sides that look great, there's no fractions, we've combined like terms, there's no more parentheses. The question is, do I have to get everything to one side and zero on the other side, or can I solve this directly like it is? The only time you ever get everything to one side is if you have a power 2 or higher. It's only time, okay? If it's just x and x, hey, that goes back to our first steps. Get rid of the smaller variable, and then it's really easy. It's not bad. So we're going to look for the smaller variable here. It happens to be 3x. We'll get 3 equals 4x minus 3. You remember doing this from the first day, I hope. And then it's not so bad to solve. We can add 3 to both sides. We'll get 6 equals 4x. 
Last step, of course, is always to divide. If there's a number in front of x, so we'll divide by 4. How much is x going to equal? 3 halves. Yeah, 6 fourths, so we're going to reduce that. We're going to simplify that to 3 halves. That's as good as we can do on this problem. That's it. You got lost. On the purple, 3x plus 3, how you got to that? We combined like minus 3 uh, and okay. 6. Just remember, you combine like terms, you're okay. circling the number with the sign, and you use an addition rule to combine those. So different signs subtract, sign a bigger number that becomes a plus 3. That's a good question. Thank you for that. Any other questions? That was good. Yeah. So at the bottom, you move that to the this one? No, um, that, yeah. This one? Yeah, you move that. Through. Right, because at this point, we're trying to isolate the x. Okay. You look where the x is, get everything away from there, okay? Right now, the x is on the right-hand side. You can't get rid of the 4 first. This 3, we certainly don't want to move that one because it's going to come over here. We have this equal to 0, and then we have to subtract it anyway, or add it anyway. So we're going to add the 3 to both sides and then divide. So once you get down to just the variable x by itself, try to get everything away from that. Good questions. Okay, let's move on. Let's try a couple more like this, and then we'll call it a day. In fact, you know what? I'd like you to do the first step here, maybe the first two steps. And then I'm going to pause you and we'll do the first two steps together. But I want to make sure you can do it. So if you would, go ahead and do the first two steps. Remember, we're trying to get rid of fractions using the LCD and then simplify both sides. That's what I want you to do now. I'll give you about a minute or so. Good, lots of good work. Hopefully you found your LCD and used that to get rid of your fractions. That would be a good start. Hey, by the way, what is your LCD in this case? Oh, no. Awesome. So when we go through, I don't really need to see the multiplying each side, but I want to see multiplying each term because that, that does mean both sides. So as long as you're doing that, you're fine. So here, I know I've got to multiply this one by 12, and this one by 12, and this one by 12. Right? Okay. That's all? Yeah. What else? Oh, good. Yeah, two things I'm missing here. One, parentheses. I don't need it around one, but I do need it around this x plus 3. And I'm definitely going to need it around this x minus 2. Otherwise, your sign is not going to change in the second part of that, in the second term. And you're going to be off by, I don't know how much, but you're going to be off. Because that right there is going to affect you. All right, so that's great. Also, there's, there's one more thing that's wrong up here. What's wrong? Okay. It doesn't just mean multiply the LCD by all the fractions. It means multiply the LCD by all the terms. No matter what they are, you multiply it by that. So out here, we also need that 12. So now we're going we're gonna to do me the favor here, and we're going to write this again, just simplified. So the 12s are gone, this becomes a 3, this becomes a 3, and we're going to rewrite it. So we have our 12x, we have our minus, don't forget about those parentheses, x minus 2, 
equals, on the right hand side, we still have this 3, don't forget about that 3 right there. We have the x plus 3. And at the very end, we have our 3 times 1, which is given us 3. By show of hands, how many people made it that far? Oh, that's great. That's very good. What now? Okay. Yeah, we're going to start that simplification process. We'll get our 12x. That minus, or that negative, if you want to consider it a negative 1, distributes to both terms, making this minus x and plus 2. I'll tell you what. Everybody would get this part right. Everybody. But if you forget your parentheses, I know that one's going to be wrong. Okay, that's, that's what happens here. It's this one that's important. Okay, on the right-hand side, we'll get our 3x plus 9, and then plus 3. Just a couple more things we have to do. We'll combine some like terms, and then we'll have a simple equation. Are there any power 2s, by the way? So are we going to have to set everything to one side? No, we're, it's going to be real similar to this. We'll get rid of the smaller variable. Power 2. One side equal to zero, use zero product property when you factor. If it's not like that, get rid of the smaller variable. So there's two options, well not options, there's two cases there. So here we'll have our 11x plus two, we'll have our three x plus 12. Not so bad after that, what's the smaller variable in this case? So we'll subtract that from both sides. We'll have eight x plus two equals 12. Almost done. We're just going to get rid of the constant term first, then divide by 8. So we're getting everything away from our x. Last step, let's divide by 8. What is that, 5 fourths? Yeah. Perfect. Hey, how many feel, people feel pretty good about what we've just done so far? Good. So we have actually conquered a lot of material uh, in the past three days. We learned how basic equations uh, do that. We've learned how to eliminate fractions from equations. If you've never seen that before, that's a pretty cool thing. I mean, you never deal with fractions and equations anymore. Awesome. We learned why. Uh, we learned how to factor and now use that in equations. We're going to do maybe two more examples, one together, one on your own. And then we'll be done with our section. We'll move on into C.3, talk a little bit about graphing. That should wrap up our day. Tell me what you know about this, this problem. Tell me a couple things about it. The square is important. We, we know the square is important. That means eventually we're going to get everything to one side. Tell me another thing you see about this problem. Fraction. fraction. Can we get rid of fractions in this case? No. What's there that tells you you can or you can't? If there's an equal sign, you can get rid of fractions. If there's no equal sign, then you cannot. Am I be, being clear on that one? So since there's an equal sign, we can get rid of that fraction. There's also one more thing we can do. If you don't like the way this looks, it's 5 halves x. You can make it, if you like, 5x over 2. They're, they're exactly the same mathematically. Um, now, if that was already equal to 0, yeah. would the, would, would the uh, getting rid of the, uh, the, fact, the fractions? work even though it was zero? Absolutely, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, what he said was, if this was actually equal to zero, like if we had to subtract three from both sides first, could you still do it? And the answer is yeah. It's just you multiply by the LCD, 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 LCD still, but LCD times zero would still be zero. Do you get me? So yeah, it, it works, absolutely. It works every time. As long as you have an equation, just follow this process down, it'll work out great for you. So let's continue this. Since we have a fraction, we're going to get we're going to get rid of that using the LCD. What is the LCD in our case? Yeah, it's just that one. If there's only one denominator, that clearly has to be your LCD, right? So let's go ahead and use that. How many things am I multiplying by 2 here? Three. Good. So here, yes. Here, definitely. 
And don't forget about that three. Oh my gosh, people always forget about that three. They go, oh, it's on the other side. I don't need to do that. This is the whole fundamental reason that we can do this, is that we have an equation. And what you do to one side, you do to the other. So we multiply by two real quick, real quick. What are we going to end with? Good, those twos are gone. We have 5x equals? This one's kind of nice. No distribution that we have to do. That's, that's kind of nice. None of this nasty stuff that we did over here. Kind of set straightforward to us. Now, can we solve this just like it is, or do we have to move some things around? And what tells you that? Great. Moving around because power 2 is what she said, and how are we going to do that? Okay. So let's do that. Now, here's a question for you. Could you have moved the 3 first? Yeah. Sure. And the same thing would work out. Notice if you moved the 3 first, you have minus 3 there, right? If you multiplied everything by 2, you'd still have the minus 6 that we're about to get. So it works out either way. It's fine. Okay, we should be almost pros at this now. What's the next thing we're going to do? Factor, yeah. Can't be a difference of squares because there's three terms. So we're going to factor by a diamond problem. For the interest of time, we're going to do this together. So on our diamond problem, what goes on the top? How about the bottom? Good, negative 20, not the negative 6, right? We multiply those things, we get negative 24. You're trying to add to 5, you're trying to multiply negative 24. Think about it in your head, don't say it out loud yet. Think about it in your head for about 5 seconds. Do you have the numbers? Three. There's options, right? 12 and 2, 6 and 4, 8 and 3, there's only one that's going to work. Negative 3, positive 6 and 4. Negative what now? Eighteen. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to do it. In, it. You can do it negative three and positive eight if you want. Just so that you can see this one more time, I'm going to do it this way so you can see a little, a little method again. <clears throat> yeah, it's exactly right. Now, can we go directly to the factors, or do we have the extra step here? Perfect. So we're going to break this up as four x squared plus eight x minus 3x minus 6, and that's still equal to 0. We do this because we can factor by grouping now. We'll factor out what from here? 4x. Perfect. And we will get... Looks like, looks like x plus 2 to me. Now, can you tell me, and this is the reason why I wrote it in this order, what do you factor out of these two terms, a positive or a negative? Negative. Yeah. Negative what? 3. Three. Three. If you factor out negative 3, notice that this will become positive x and this will become what? Positive 2. Do you see why the sign changes, folks? We're factoring out a negative. You're dividing a negative by a negative. Looks like we did it right. If you had got different signs here, you would have done something wrong. You'd go back and fix it at this point. Now we're going to factor out the x plus 2. And what are we going to be left with when we factor out the x plus 2? Perfect. Hey, we finally get a different case, right, where we can set each one of them equal to zero. Since these things are different, the zero part of the property works just fine for us. We're going to set not only the x plus 2 equal to zero, but we're also going to set the 4x minus 3 equal to zero. Do a little Harry Potter math magic on this thing. Bam! We'll get the answer by some simple algebra. We'll get x equals negative 2, that's one answer, and we'll get, what, what are we going to get on the right hand side? Yeah, we'll add that 3, sorry, it's getting a little cramped, we're going to get x equals 3 fourths. Two solutions, both of them work. And that's because we have the, the square, that power 2 says you're going to get two solutions out of that. Okay, let's start one more since we have a couple minutes here. I want you to at least do the first step. I'd like the first two steps. See how far you can get on it.
And what's a weekend without a little homework, right? So, I mean, no one wants that. I swear, I'm not really a jerk. I just play one on TV. By the way, as you're doing the work, I really hope that on your homework you factored out the GCF first before you tried diamond problems, because there's one of them that's like 20x squared minus like 200x yes. plus like 600. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't factor out the 20, that problem takes forever. You factor out the 20, it takes five seconds. It's really, really fast. So you have to factor GCF. It took me like five minutes to figure that out. Yeah, see, right? like, oh. it takes so long, you go, oh my gosh. Leonard, are you serious? <laughs> Negative 100 on the top and like 12,000 on the bottom? You're crazy. Yeah, I know. I was like, okay, something's wrong. So yeah. I was like, oh, Factor GCF. Yeah. GCF is, is huge on this problem. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that class on Monday if I grade this. Okay, we have about 20 seconds. I just want to make sure you can get the first couple steps. First couple steps are you're going to multiply everything by 2. You're going to get 8x squared, you're going to get 15x, and you're going to get 2. Did you make it that far? Yeah. Your next step you have to do, get everything to one side because you have the x squared. You should have 8x squared minus 15x minus 2 equals 0, and then we're going to use a diamond problem to wrap that thing up. Did you guys get that far? Okay. Do you see, are, are we all right on, on doing that? Okay, we'd have the negative 15 on the top and negative 16 on the bottom. And then we work it from there. <clears throat> I think we have enough to do this. Yeah, go ahead. Well, because what I did, sorry, you know, I, I missed some steps here. I subtracted 15x from both sides, and I also subtracted 2 from both sides. Okay, so that's how it, it moved over there. I'll write that out for you. And then use the diamond problem just like we did in the previous example. Just want to make sure you can get down this far because we've already covered the factory that will lead you to the rest of this. How many people uh, understood what we talked about today? I feel pretty good about this stuff. All right, that homework should be due on Monday. Guys, have a great weekend.